My name is Avery, I work at Yahoo, and this work is actually joint between me and another uh, former coworker, Christian. So uh, our project really focuses on scalable graph processing. Uh, and the motivation, I think, is pretty clear. The real world web and social graphs have grown to very immense scale. These numbers are fairly old, I think, uh, and they've increased significantly since then, but we know there are a ton of web pages out there and the rise of social networks are growing into the hundreds of millions of users, maybe soon to hit a billion users. And with all this social graphs or web graphs, uh, there's a lot of great features and applications you can build around that with respect to getting relevant information or personalized information uh, for users. So maybe it's um, some important news article that comes up inside of uh, your social inbox or you know, the way that you get results based on something about your personality. And a lot of this kind of work can be done based on uh, graph processing. Some examples in web graphs, obviously, uh, PageRank is very famous, and there are variations of it that are used. And in social graphs, um, there's a lot of other things you might want to compute, uh, shared connection, shortest paths, max clicks, uh, personalized rankings, that kind of thing. Um, so how do you do this kind of iterative graph processing? Uh, we use Hadoop for a lot of big data computation. Um, but if you run a whole series of MapReduce jobs to do iterative graph processing, you're going to run into big um, overheads. And I think Arun mentioned this in his, his previous talk on Next Generation MapReduce, that you can have it like a 10 times basically performance overhead in iterative, iterative processing if you, if you use Hadoop for that. And also, that, also we see that the MapReduce programming model itself is not really a great fit for the graph algorithms. It doesn't you know, lend itself nicely towards the APIs. You probably have to build something on top of it uh, for your graph. Uh, Google came out with this great idea about Pregel, uh, focused uh, based on bulk synchronous parallel model, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, we can't use it because we work at Yahoo. That's too bad. And um, the other thing that we found out about it was that it requires its own computing infrastructure. So that's unfortunate too. So you have to have a completely separate infrastructure just for doing graph computations. And some people can't afford to have you know, more than one cluster. Finally, there's a master, there's a single point of failure in their system. Um, another solution that we have used in the past was message passing interface or MPI. Um, it's pretty fast, but the major problems you'll see with it is that, one, you really don't have built-in fault tolerance, and that's, that's uh, unfortunate in, when running on commodity hardware. And two, it's very generic. It's just really about messages passed between processes. So building a graph processing infrastructure on top of it is a lot of work. So um, this is what we did with Giraffe. We said, look, there are a whole ton of Hadoop installations around the world, and we want to leverage that for iterative graph processing. So what, what we do is we use the Hadoop uh, framework as a resource uh, allocator for us. And we can run on top of your existing Hadoop uh, infrastructure. Um, we know the deployment's great, uh, very wide at Yahoo with the tens of thousands of machines and the continued investment we have in it, uh, as well as outside of Yahoo. So you, you could run on EC2, and there's you know, other companies as well. Giraffe leverages the bulk synchronous parallel model uh, by Valiant, and that's really the key about a lot of the features and fault tolerance that's built into Giraffe. Uh, the, and, um, and with this model, we are able to load the input data once during the application, and everything at that point happens in memory. Um, bulk synchronous parallel allows us to do uh, a lot of the fault tolerance. I mentioned this. Uh, we can adjust to things that happen on the grid. So for instance, if tasks go, or workers in our case go down, or in the case that you actually have more workers avail or more tasks available to you, we can actually take advantage of that as we proceed through our application. And we use Zookeeper um, as a fault tolerant coordination service. Um, we allow, we, if you have a running Zookeeper on your cluster, you can utilize that one. If not, we'll spawn one up dynamically for you when you start your job. And um, we uh, take the Pregel inspired vertex centric API uh, as, a, as a graph processing model. So you implement basically a compute function uh, for every single ver that gets executed on every single vertex in the cluster. It's similar to the map method in Hadoop. Uh, and finally, we're open source. Um, we just published this code uh, yesterday or early this morning, the way, whichever way you want to look at it. OK. So BSP. Uh, BSP is really a, a way of looking at um, composing an application as a series of super steps. Uh, super step is just 
some unit of aggregate computation. It's um, a place where a lot of operations can happen in parallel, and it cannot be subdivided. So uh, in the very generic form, you think of a super step as composed of several components that can send messages to each other uh, during that super step. Those messages are not delivered until the next super step, and the ordering of those messages is not guaranteed um, at all, only that you got that message. Uh, okay. So how do you write a giraffe application? Um, well, it's, it's very similar to writing a MapReduce application when you think about a, the map method in Hadoop works on a key value tuple. And in draft, you have this compute method that works on your vertex. Um, and you get this message iterator uh, as part of uh, your API call, and it, tell, it lets you basically iterate over the messages that were sent from the previous uh, super step. In our implementation, you pick four different types. There is the vertex ID, uh, there is the vertex value, the edge value, and the message value. In our API, um, we allow you to do a lot of different things. You can do local mutations, so you could, um, or get data, or you can set data locally. You can get your ID, you can get your vertex value, you can set your vertex value, um, get a list of outward edges, um, what super step you're on, those types of things. And those changes all will happen immediately uh, and av available to that uh, vertex. Uh, there's also messaging. So you're allowed to send message to any vertex, whether or not you have an outgoing edge to it. Um, Finally, there's, oh, sorry, there's also a graphite mutation, which allows you to basically, uh, from any vertex, you can try to create or remove uh, a vertex or an edge on a remote vertex. And that, uh, the application of that particular graphite mutation is similar to messages. So they're um, handled at the, next, at the next super step. And you vote to halt. So every vertex will, will have an active state or an inactive state. Um, once all the vertices have voted to halt, they're all inactive, then the application is complete. Okay. Um, it's best to really illustrate why a vertex-centric API is nice for doing iterative graph uh, computation, and that's best with an example. All the um, highlighted purple uh, methods are provided by the API, um, and here we have an example of PageRank. Uh, the, notion, the idea is that you have loaded your data up using a vertex input format. So you have the notional page rank values um, from previous super step. You're going to sum up the uh, incoming page ranks uh, from, um, from your, your in links. And then you do some calculation to set your value with a contribution. Finally, you send some um, distributed value across your edges. And in this case, we're just making a very simple uh, ending condition, which is once you've passed 30 super steps, you could vote to halt. OK, so getting to a little bit of how we implement this. This is implemented as a map-only job in Hadoop. Um, and uh, we then get a series of map tasks. And each map task will run uh, one or more uh, threads that, uh, that compose a draft application um, internally. Uh, again, Zookeeper. If you already have a running Zookeeper instance, you can actually leverage that. You can just point it towards that Zookeeper instance uh, or some particular directory in that Zookeeper in instance. But if not, we'll start one up automatically for you. Um, let me go into detail a little bit about each responsibility. So the master is responsible for all the coordination of the application. Um, it's responsible for the initial um, reading of the vertex input format to get some splits and designating work for the uh, workers. It's also responsible for all the synchronization of each super step as well as determining when the application is complete. So it handles also things that will happen within a super step. So if there's failure of a worker, if there is uh, more resources available, it'll handle those changes, uh, as well as things like you know, how we shift around the vertices to do uh, balancing of work. And the worker task is uh, quite simple. It's responsible for doing some reading of, vertex split, of vertexes into memory. It will execute the compute function for every single vertex that is active. Uh, and responsible for buffering incoming messages that were sent during the previous super step. Uh, Zookeeper we use to maintain global application state, as well as to provide the uh, coordination uh, between uh, threads. So the way our, our distribution works is that you provide us a vertex input uh, format. And this data then is uh, divided into vertex splits, very similar to the way that you have a um, input format in Hadoop, and it's divided into input input splits. At that point, the workers then read um, one or more vertex splits and then process them into smaller uh, pieces, which we call vertex ranges. The reason for processing them into smaller regions is that 
we, can, we then have this, the granularity at which we can um, move them from one, one worker to the next, or if we had more workers that were available in the next super step, we could actually um, spread out the vertices uh, across the workers more, more fairly. And uh, prior to every super step, the master is responsible for assigning each worker uh, you know, zero or more vertex ranges. Uh, during a super step, there are actually a lot of complicated things that happen. So the first thing that happens in a super step is that every worker tries to register its health uh, for that particular super step, letting the master know whether it's available or not for, or uh, can, can do something useful during the super step. Um, the master then will select some subset of those workers uh, to, for computation. And at that point, if desired, you can, it'll, it'll tell everybody to do a checkpoint. And the checkpoint is um, determined uh, uh, at a frequency determined by the user. So the user can just say, well, I want to checkpoint every five super steps or every 10 super steps. Um, and after that, uh, and the, oh, by the way, I want to go back. The checkpoint is actually uh, implemented by the infrastructure itself. All the types that we have here are writable. So that means that uh, it's very easy for us to actually um, you know, push all that data down into uh, a checkpoint format, and then we can load it back up in case there is a failure during the application. Um, then we have this phase where we basically do, um, if desired, so the user, right now we have some default balancers of vertex ranges. Uh, you can balance uh, based on the number of vertices in, that, you, that each worker has. You can balance on the based on the number of edges. Uh, we also allow the user to write their own code to determine how to balance the, the vertex ranges across workers. Maybe there are some uh, locality uh, optimizations that you're aware of that we're not aware of from the infrastructure point of view. And, this, and, that's, and that's part of this stage of exchanging vertex ranges. And finally, after this is done, the compute function is executed by every worker for every vertex that's active, and the message exchange occurs. Um, I mean, the key thing really here is that uh, all of this is allowed through the bulk string as parallel model. It allows us to, to handle the cases in which we expand and reduce our resources as the application proceeds during the cluster. It allows us to resume from faults since every super step is an atomic unit of computation. If we die during super step, we just uh, restart from the last checkpointed super step and everything proceeds uh, as, as expected. Okay, fault tolerance. Um, we don't have any single pin of failure in our system uh, from the BSP point of view. And actually, so it, uh, if a master, um, if a master goes down, we have backup masters or standby masters that are ready to take on the active role. If a worker thread dies, um, I've talked about this before, but we can, we can go from previously checkpointed super steps and actually uh, restart your application automatically for you. So there's nothing um, for an operator to do. And if a Zookeeper server dies, as long as you've maintained a quorum, your application will be able to proceed. Now, there's still are a couple of single points of failure um, that is uh, inherent in Hadoop, which is the name node and the job tracker. Uh, but as we saw in previous talks, so that's being worked on actively. And once that's fixed, there will be no single point of failure in, the, in our application. Um, that being said, right now, you can also restart manually from a checkpoint. So if you were running an application, a long-running application in your cluster, and then your, your cluster went down for whatever reason, as long as you can find a, a valid checkpoint, you could restart it. OK. Just a little more detail about how the master fault tolerance works. We basically have a queue of masters that are, that are waiting to become the active master. Um, we only have one active master at a time, and this is guaranteed through Zookeeper. All of the ap active master state itself is stored in Zookeeper so that in case um, the active master goes down, when the next spare becomes the active, uh, it's very easy for it to resume where the other master left off. Um, and this is made possible basically through Zookeeper. And the worker thread fault tolerance. So if any worker at any point um, during that, that's been selected for a super step dies, basically everybody will uh, abort. And we actually just fail all the tasks, and then we, and they all get restarted again. And then a, a super step will resume from that previous checkpoint. Um, this can keep going on and on as long as you have enough you know, workers that are available uh, at the minimum to complete your application. Um, the way we detect the health is through Zookeeper 2. So once a, once, a, once a worker is registered as health with the um, application, with a super step, the master is watching that state actively. So if that, if that goes down during the super step, then we know that something happened to that worker. Um, and the master is also responsible for letting all the workers know when it detects a failure that you guys all got to restart. Okay, so we've got a couple of optional features, um, which are, uh, which we think are going to help people. One is the combiner. 
And the combiners are very similar to the way MapReduce combiners work, uh, just a way to reduce the amount of messaging that's sent across the wire, as well as saving memory um, for not having to hold all those messages. You basically can um, write some, and this is something that's done as an application-specific basis. We don't, as an infrastructure, know how to do this correctly for your application. So you write something that says you take a message list, and then you can basically shrink it down to a single message, which with, with whatever aggregation technique you like. We run this both on the client side, so before the message, while the, we buffer some messages before we send them, and then also we run the server side um, to save memory as well. Aggregators are a way to um, compute graph-wide uh, values. And they're similar to, if, you, if you're familiar with MPI at all, they're very similar to the MPI aggregation routine, routines that are available, uh, min, max, sum, those types of things. Um, it's basically a way for um, all the vertices to communicate together. Uh, users can write their own aggregators, so um, you can write whatever you'd like to do, and they just need to be commutative and associative because they're being performed uh, globally. And some examples for what you might want to do is, I don't know, computer running average as you're going along through your application, um, or the max and min values. Uh, it's useful for um, any kind of other global communication you need. Uh, maybe a tolerance value for your page rank, so if you haven't seen a lot of changes in your last page rank calculation, um, that's maybe it's a good time to halt the application as well as things like monitoring, statistics, keeping track of how many vertices you want um, or that are around your application, those types of things. Okay, so we've got some early Yahoo customers. Uh, the first team that we, we were working with was the Web of Objects team. We've been using it currently for the movie, movie database with tens of millions of records. We've run it with up to 400 uh, workers uh, on, as a, with the application. We've got about four or five different applications. Uh, some of them include uh, popularity rank, shared connections, personalized page rank, and we're looking into implementing a whole bunch more applications to generate useful features um, that can be then uh, turned into uh, things for our customers. And the other customer we have is the web map, and that's the team I used to formally work on, uh, where we would calculate page rank type values on web scale data, so 250 billion web pages or whatever uh, we have today. Um, that the current solution, just to note, uh, was using MPI in the past, and we were bitten heavily by both of the issues of ha not having fault tolerance, very customizable code uh, when trying to run um, uh, commodity machines. And so we're looking really forward to uh, having an infrastructure that is not only scalable, but also fault tolerant uh, to a variety of different things that can happen um, during a running application. Uh, future work. So we've got uh, a series of unit tests um, that test a lot of the different fault tolerance cases, but we're looking to really uh, improve uh, our range there because we want to make sure that uh, our application or that giraffe can sustain, um, can sustain the failures we say it can. Um, and we're looking to do some performance testing. We only know that we can test with that 400 workers and it ran successfully. We run it, we're running it in production today. Uh, we want to run with thousands or tens of thousands of workers. Um, and we've got a bunch of different graph algorithms already implemented. We want to take those and move them to a library that will basically ship along with the package. So that way, you know, for someone uh, from another company or um, a researcher that wants to just, you know, pull out some data with an input format, they can just run an included algorithm automatically. We also, uh, as another side note, we think that it's very useful uh, just from an API point of view. So right now everything is stored in memory, and this makes the iterative applications really fast. Um, but we still, th and so but there's a series of applications which uh, may run out of core. And we still think the programming model is useful, so we're thinking of ways we can um, basically uh, surpass the available memory on the system so we could just dump some messages to disk or you know, work out of core somehow, or even convert to a native MapReduce application. Um, also, we're looking at ways in improving our data distribution. So right now, we, our scheme is to take uh, some input splits and then subdivide them into smaller pieces. But we're looking at um, maybe a little bit more like the way that H-based uh, um, regions work. So, the notion that you start off with some, with some initial, initial regioning, and then as the application is changing, so your, your graph may mutate, you may increase the number of vertices in that system, or remove some, being able to split or merge these vertex ranges and then spread them out across the workers to do uh, better load distribution. Okay. With that being said, um, graph is, Giraffe is already a graph, a graph processing infrastructure that runs today on existing Hadoop infrastructure. Uh, we would love to be able to make this work on top of uh, the next generation MapReduce since it would fit very well with our model. Um, and we've been in talks with uh, people like Arun to, to make that happen. Um, but that being said, you could use it today on your Hadoop uh, cluster as long as you're running 20.2, 203. 
or better. Uh, and it's open source. Um, it may not be indexable right yet uh, since I submitted it last night, but uh, here's the link. And uh, we have an Apache incubator proposal. We're working on it a little bit to, before submission, but that's the route we intend to go and pushing it to uh, the Apache model. And uh, at this time, I'm happy to have any questions or comments. Did you happen to hear the Spark talk to the, earlier today? I did. And how would I you did. compare this with that approach? Uh, I did ask a question during the Spark talk as well uh, about uh, the immutability. So I don't know a whole lot about Spark except for what I read in a paper and in this talk and the idea that the resilient data, data sets uh, are immutable. So the way, so in our case, um, it, some of the ideas are similar in the sense that we're caching the data set in memory. Um, but from a mutability standpoint, I don't know how that works. So a big part of the way they handle their fault tolerances is, is through the immutable data sets, being able to reload those and then reapply all the changes that happened. Um, I don't exactly know how that would work in this kind of infrastructure. I don't know how, I don't, I don't know how it plays in with checkpointing and things like that. But uh, it would be very interesting to talk to them about that. Oh, by the way, I'd just like to mention that um, as we're moving forward with the proposal, we've had some interest from uh, some developers that are also interested in graph processing as contributing to the project or being users. And I'd love to hear more. Um, so please feel free to find me and email me uh, if you're interested in this. So I don't know much about the Apache HAMA project, but I know it's also BSP on top of Hadoop, I think. Yes. How, how is this different or similar okay. to that? So um, what I've read about Apache HAMA is it's uh, um, focusing a little bit more on scientific computing and more about the generic BSP framework itself, as opposed to being specific for graphs. Also, they, I don't think that, I think they require separate infrastructure to run on as well, so they, you can't be launching on the same cluster that you run Hadoop. And um, I'm not sure if they figure out the fault tolerance issues quite yet. Uh, is it possible to actually get a triple store and a Sparkle query uh, implemented on your graph processing? Have you thought along those lines? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I missed. So I missed. you did talk about the graph processing, but not about how you would like to store those graphs yeah. in, in what that mm -hmm. reform or uh, representation would be like. So triple stores is usually probably one of the ways that graphs are at least um, recommended they be stored. Okay. And a lot of times Sparkle query are the ones that are run on graphs to generate insights like Hive on, um, on HDFS, okay. uh, um, relational data storage. Are you thinking along the lines of going towards triple stores and Sparkle queries? So right now we just have a uh, vertex input format and vertex output format that we expect the user to implement. Um, we, we, can, we would love to, to try to integrate with some of that, uh, that, that technology you talked about. Um, and additionally, just to go beyond that, uh, we're looking especially with respect to storing graphs in HBase in particular because of the fact that HBase is already sorted for us. And we do require sorted input this time. Uh, but in the future, we're looking to probably go away from that so we can support unordered uh, data coming to the graph. 